you're watching this probably because you or somebody you love suffers from cardiovascular disease. Maybe you're taking high blood pressure medication. Maybe it's to the point where the doctors are saying that you have 70% occlusion in the carotid artery. Uh, maybe they are telling you that the cramping you're experiencing in your calves when you walk short distance, maybe about 50 feet or 100 feet, the cramping happens so terribly that you have to sit down and you can't continue to walk. Maybe they've diagnosed you with peripheral arterial disease, PAD and the pain or numbness or tingling or burning or all the above is happening from your calves down to the feet, the soles of the feet, or maybe it's just in the soles of the feet. Or maybe you feel that you get a shortness of breath because even with the blood pressure medications and the cholesterol medications that you're taking, you just are not having the proper cardiovascular function that you wish you could have like maybe 20 or 30 years ago. In my opinion, a cardiovascular risk assessment is not complete until and unless a coronary calcium score is performed. A coronary calcium score, what is that and what does that mean and how would that help you and your physician understand what complexity you're really dealing with? You see right here, this is a CAT scan machine. It's something they measure called a CT coronary calcium score. It measures the calcium, the plaque buildup around your heart, it can be more accurate than an EKG or a stress test. Dr. Savo, tell us why something like this can be very important and it could possibly save lives. It's been around for a while, since the uh, 1990s. As doctors, we're asked to predict what is inside your body and something that we can't see. So stress testing is a non-invasive way, but it doesn't pick up everything. For the things that we miss, we really want to know what's going on inside your heart, and that's where a coronary calcium score can be helpful. With me is Dr. Cusseter. We want to show our audience here this heart. He had a symptom where he passed out. He came in, got this done. This is the left side of the coronary arteries and you see all this bright white stuff here is all calcium deposition in the arteries and this is all plaque so this is extensive this involves throughout the left uh, coronary artery and then we also see it over here in the right coronary arteries as well the total score was 880 and that is anything over 400 is considered severe. When I was working up his passing out, this was really the only test that came back abnormal. And it was kind of the last test that we did. So he passed the EKG, he passed the stress test and everything? Yes, he did. He passed all the other testing. All the other testing was normal. This was the only wow. test that was abnormal. We all know that checking your cholesterol is a good thing. And if you have high cholesterol, we all worry about heart disease. Well, a new literature shows that this coronary calcium scoring is more predictive of underlying coronary disease than checking your cholesterol. So in theory, you could have normal cholesterol, a normal lipid test, and have a high coronary calcium score sitting under there. Okay. My uncle, he is about 71 years of age. He lives up in New Jersey. He's an active man. He bicycles about 15, 20, 25 miles a day. He eats what he thinks is the right diet. He does take blood pressure medication, but his blood pressure is pretty much under control. Very active, thin, not overweight at all. I made him get a coronary calcium score, a CT scan. I looked back at his records. He was shocked when I told him the information. He didn't realize he had done this five years prior and then 10 years prior. He had 10 years ago a score of less than 100. Five years ago, and this is 2014, he had a score of a bit about 230 or 250. In 2014, he had a score over 450. In 10 years, it went from less than 100 to over 450, taking blood pressure medication. So the blood pressure medication that he's taking and all the exercise and the high fiber diet that he's doing that he claims is great, his calcium burden is getting worse inside the arteries. That no matter how many blood pressure medications he takes or cholesterol medications that he takes, his calcium score is now in the severe range and he's under care of different doctors to help make sure that he can keep his health or so he thought. Male, 78 years old and he was experiencing mild dementia and foot problems. I noticed that his neuropathy in his feet, there was barely a pulse in his feet. From the ankle down, I couldn't no match the pulse from the wrist to the foot. But his calcium score it was 1,835. 
they did another CT scan of this man's chest and it showed 90 to 99% occlusion on one side of the heart and total occlusion on the other side of the heart. They told him he should not leave the facility that day. They should get him into the surgery right away because he was a walking time bomb. He's a heart attack or a stroke waiting to happen. This man never knew this was developing in his body. He thought he was fine. He told me, I'm not on blood pressure medication, Dr. Herman. I don't need to get my heart checked. I've already been cleared by the doctors. My heart's fine. A stress test proved it. I've been through the EKG. Everything came out fine. But that wasn't the case because I'm the one who caught that he had severe blockage. Blood that's supposed to be flowing through the artery here and what you see is all of this white matter. Uh, you can see it around the aortic valve, you can see it around the tricuspid, you can see this in any artery going up to the brain, going through the neck, going down to the legs. You can see this in various areas. What do you think that is? These are all calcium deposits. There's some cholesterol that mixes in there, but it's not a cholesterol burden here. It is a calcified burden. Cholesterol is a soft, gooey substance. It doesn't harden, and cholesterol is needed by the body to repair things. The hardening of the artery, the arteriosclerosis, the placking of the artery is because of calcifications. There is one kind of infection that has been discovered, and it's called nanobacteria. It has been renamed into calcified nanoparticles. There's a great book called The Calcium Bomb. The subtitle is the nanobacteria linked to heart disease and cancer. This bacteria exudes a biofilm and it actually attracts calcium and phosphorus from your bones and from your teeth. There is a dental chart called the Meridian Dental Chart that the Germans made, they discovered and created back in the 50s or the 60s, and what they found was that a tooth was connected to a diseased organ. Your teeth have arteries and they have nerves. Any infection living in your tooth, in the root of the tooth, in the root canal, in the crown, in the cap, in the gums, and you may not even have bleeding gums, any of that infection that could be in the jaw bone, it can and will get into that bloodstream and go to various organs in the body. Here's the bottom, here's the top of the mouth, the right, the left on the left rear upper molar and look what organ that tooth is directly connected to, to the heart. Now what the Germans said over more years of research is this tooth, the longer it's infected, it could spread through the gums and the bone to go to other teeth and it could spread from that blood vessel that went to the heart to other blood vessels and infect other organs. I find this every day in my clinic, in my practice. I do a complete dental examination. I don't need a dental x-ray. I don't need the dental chair. I've learned some kinesiology skills that I can actually tell. Is there an infection in the pulp of the tooth? Is there an infection in the root of the tooth? Is there an infection in the gums or in the jawbone? Is there an infection in the parotid gland or the tonsils or the parathyroid? Is there an infection in the sinus? Is any of this draining down to the body? Is your tooth that's been crowned by your best dentist, is that root canal that was done by the best dentist on the block, is that tooth holding infection and heavy metal toxins? And if so, we have to deal with it because that tooth can be connected directly to your heart, to your blood vessels being damaged. Here's a tooth that came out of another patient. This person comes to me from Ohio. We ran the CT scan on him, score over 700, didn't even know. Goes for a stress test, gets an EKG, not taking any blood pressure medications, feels okay. One of the first things we found in his mouth was an infection. He came to me and said, my dentist told me everything's fine. I said, no, it's not, and this tooth is connected to your heart. Let's take it out. It was a cavity-filled tooth, and you can see this big gray area down here, dirty, infected with fungus, bacteria, and parasites in the tooth. His dentist told him his mouth was fine. Here's another tooth that came out of another patient. This is a crown, a porcelain crown that's upside down. You can see the metal jacket on the inside. There's the porcelain around it. Look at this fungal, gross, disgusting, degenerative, disease-filled tooth. Here's the root of the tooth, and here's the other parts of the teeth. This part broke off as they pulled the cap off the tooth. Here's a patient who came to me from New York with a root canal that I found infection. The dentist said it's not. I said it's infection. The patient understood. The patient asked the dentist to pull it out. The tooth broke in half. You can see a little black thing sticking out of the bottom here. 
here's what we saw inside. You can see this black piece sticking out and coming out the other end. It was an infection pipeline literally running through that root canal, going to his heart, going to his brain. The dentist called me. I saw the x-ray. There's nothing wrong with this root canal, Dr. Herman. It looks perfect. There's no infection in the tooth. There's no infection in the bone. I find nothing wrong with this man's mouth. The patient said, please follow what Dr. Herman said. They took out the tooth. The patient came here an hour and a half later with a smile. He couldn't believe the strength he had back in his legs after pulling this tooth. Root canal, you could see the white filling. Again, same patient. You could see the black thing coming out of the bottom. Root canal that looked great on an x-ray had infection running through it, connected. Here's a woman. It was a filled wisdom tooth, but what we saw in the dentist said, nothing wrong with it. Don't take it out. Everything is okay. Don't listen to Dr. Herman. And you could see once the tooth came out, this was on the inside, on the tongue side of the tooth. Didn't show up on x-ray. They couldn't see it. An infection living inside. There was a hole in this tooth that was infected. Here's the tooth from the top. You can see the cavity filling. Here's another tooth we had to get pulled out of her mouth. It broke in half when the dentist pulled it out. See this big gray spot right here? That gray spot was infection living in her mouth. Bacteria and Lyme infection living in this tooth. Here's another patient. You know your kidneys help support your heart? Well, this woman came to me. She had kidney failure, lupus, blood pressure regulation problems. They couldn't figure out how to keep her blood pressure stable. Wisdom tooth. Look at this hole. Nobody ever found it. I found when I did my dental exam on her, infection living in the tooth. It was a hole that the infection was boring into the tooth. She said, you know, I've had sensitivity there for many years, but nobody ever said anything to me. They told me I could leave the tooth a little longer. This tooth, the infection was going from this tooth through the blood vessel in the tooth down to her kidney right through the blood vessel system to the kidney, infecting the kidney, weakening the kidney, stressing the heart. Atherosclerosis, that's hardening of your arteries. Now typically people have this idea that this problem comes purely from consuming too much cholesterol. There's always a pre-existing lesion or crack in the artery before this whole chain of event occurs. It's a microhemorrhaging. What happens is the cholesterol comes in there as a band-aid to heal the bleeding crack in your arteries. And it actually works with calcium to form a like a little band-aid. And what causes the lesion or the crack is usually a low vitamin C situation because the person is not consuming enough vegetables. And I'm not talking about the synthetic vitamin C, I'm talking about real vitamin C in its whole complex. Because vitamin C in the complex has a factor, it's a type of copper in an enzyme form called tyrosinase, which basically helps you form collagen. If you don't have that factor, you get a lot of cracks and problems in the vascular system. Loss of collagen, everything becomes very rigid. So we need the vitamin C from the vegetables. Cholesterol will also go way up with insulin. In fact, unless you have a genetic problem with cholesterol, which is very rare, I will bet anything your cholesterol is coming from too much insulin. So if you were to cut out all the carbs, like refined carbs and sugars and alcohol, that cholesterol will come down faster than anything with probably within a month. Now, other things that can cause this calcium buildup would be taking too much calcium in the wrong form, especially. Let's say you're taking calcium carbonate. That is limestone. That is cement. Then you actually add it with vitamin D, calcium with vitamin D. You know what vitamin D does? It actually helps you absorb calcium in the gut by 20 times, not by 20 percent, 20 x. So you're absorbing all this calcium and the blood is filling up with calcium. That's going to cause what's called hypercalcemia. So the combination of this vitamin D with calcium, which so many people are taking as a supplement, because you get tested by the doctor, he says you're low vitamin D, so you start taking it, you add some calcium in there, right? And you think you're doing yourself some good, but what happens is you're just filling up the arteries with calcium, especially if you don't have the magnesium, because magnesium helps to buffer the calcium as well.
if someone has too much calcium or too much unavailable calcium, they will get some bone pain. They'll have insomnia. So let's say you're exhausted and you need to sleep, but your head won't turn off. It's very active. It won't go to sleep. That means you have too much calcium. Soft tissue calcification. This calcium kind of starts plugging up all the soft tissues, like of the kidney as a kidney stone, the gallbladder as gallstones, arteries as placking, the eyes as cataracts, arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis, all the itises. And that's just because the calcium is not able to be mobilized. Then we get constipation. Constipation is one symptom of too much calcium. Why? Because calcium causes a contraction of the smooth muscle. That's why it causes bronchial spasm too of the lung or asthma symptoms because there's too much contraction and not enough relaxation. Excessive urination. That's one symptom as well. This could come from diabetes and other things, but too much calcium is one of the symptoms. Cramps like muscle cramps, especially at night, if your toes start bending like this and you flex them and it starts cramping, that's too much calcium. Anxiety, arrhythmias, high blood pressure. If you think about one of the treatments to high blood pressure, they use calcium channel blockers. All they're doing is they're blocking calcium because you got too much calcium. The opposing mineral to calcium is magnesium and that is one of the best natural calcium channel blocker that you can get. If anybody does construction in here they'll know very quickly how do you want to harden concrete you add calcium. A women's health study actually was showed 50 percent increased fracture risk with the highest calcium intake. Did it help prevent any osteoporosis fractures? No, they actually increased. Calcium leads to kidney stones, gallstones, bone spurs, plaque, calcium deposits, cataracts, brain shrinkage, and dysfunction. Numerous medical problems, heart disease, hardening of the arteries, dementia, cancer, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and over 90% of hypertension, I believe, is contributed to by this low sodium and high calcium issue. If bones were made of calcium, that would be one thing. We would probably be more like chalk when you think about it. It's mostly calcium. There's actually a total of 84 elements in the human body. Strontium is commonly used in Europe. It's being used worldwide to treat osteoporosis, a lot less in the United States. Strontium is an interfering mineral. When it gets incorporated into bone, it forms abnormal bone or knobs which can't be reabsorbed. And you notice them first in the hands. So if you have a high calcium, you typically have a high strontium and it's contributing to osteoarthritis, I'm sure. Osteoarthritis, dementia, brain shrinkage, and dysfunction. Probably the number one cause of dementia in the United States is get your calcium. It shrinks the brain, it causes synaptic dysfunction, and it destroys memory cells. Bone spurs, calcific plaque, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 hypothyroidism, cataracts. Every one of these diagnoses requires a hair tissue mineral analysis to further clarify and define the extent of calcium and to begin to make changes before worse, more debilitating disease or recurrent disease becomes part of your physiology. How do you develop too much calcium? Number one, you become deficient in the fat soluble vitamins. That would be vitamin D. Vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium, but it only will increase it up into the blood. It doesn't push it into the tissue, so it can plug everything up. In order for you to have vitamin D work correctly in calcium, you need another vitamin called vitamin K2. It basically removes calcium from the soft tissues of the body. It helps to clean up the calcification on the arteries. It prevents your arteries turning into bone and stone. It makes your arteries more elastic. It's really good for blood pressure. It's really good for osteoporosis. It's really good for all these conditions. Well, guess where you get vitamin K2? If you're eating typical grain-fed animal products, you're not gonna get K2. It's a fat soluble vitamin, so it's in all the fats that the doctor has been telling you to avoid. It's in cheese, it's in egg yolk, it's in grass-fed fatty meats, it's also in a soy product called NATO, it's a Japan dish, but mainly it's in the fats. So here the person is consuming 
a low-fat diet, their arteries are clogged, they put them on Coumadin, and by the way, blocks vitamin K1, so now you can't eat the vegetables, where are you going to get your vitamin C from? You take it from a pill, it's usually going to be synthetic, so you're going to take the synthetic vitamin C, which will actually aggravate everything, so it really is messed up. Here's the more likely problem that people have. They're taking these vitamins already, but they don't have enough bile from the gallbladder. Your gallbladder is right here. Bile helps you break down fat, specifically fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and F. So if you don't have a gallbladder, or you're bloated all the time, or you have constipation, which means you don't have enough bile, or you have right shoulder pain, those are all symptoms of a lack of bile, then go ahead and take some bile and then you'll actually start absorbing these fat soluble vitamins and all of a sudden things start really working. If you are under a lot of stress and you have a high level of stress hormone called cortisol from the adrenal, over time that will make you very, very alkaline in the blood, yet your pH of your urine is too acid. So when I talk about pH, I'm not talking about your urine or your saliva. I'm talking about the blood. And it's very, very hard to detect that. But one way you can detect it is if you have a lot of arthritis and calcium problems. One of the simple remedies for this is apple cider vinegar, a teaspoon in a glass of water. Because it will actually start to bring the pH down, more acidic, and start mobilizing the calcium out of the tissues. So what happens if you're deficient in vitamin K and calcium is getting inside the wrong places? Well, some of the wrong places it can get into is your arterial walls. The other place in your heart that you don't want calcium to go is your uh, heart valves, which famous uh, first lady have we heard of recently who's had some uh, surgery done? Yeah, Barbara Bush had to have a valve replaced because of inappropriate calcification of her valve. And certainly what we're finding out is that heart disease is so common, it's not unusual to find calcification in people's coronary arteries or in the carotid arteries, the plaque formation. A bicuspid aortic valve that had got calcified and completely solidified, inevitably that thing starts getting calcified and it turns a little chunk of calcium and then you have blood squirting out and then refluxing back in again. So that poor heart has to really work hard. Those folks eventually have to have heart valve replacement surgery. There's one anecdotal case of a person who started on K2 and after one year, his valve is back to functioning normally again. It sucks calcium out of our arteries and valves. Or another place where you don't want it to build up is in your cartilage. Uh, a lot of the tendons that surround your joints will become calcified. You'll have damage of the surrounding synovium of the joint and that'll become calcified. And these are the bone spurs that can create a lot of problems in the spine, in the uh, various joints throughout the body. And some people even get calcification in other t soft tissue areas of their bodies. There's pretty good evidence that K2 prevents you getting any toxicity from vitamin D. A book called The Miraculous Results of Very, Very High Doses of Vitamin D. And what he details is putting people on 20,000 to 50,000 units of vitamin D, and you'll never get toxic as long as you're on vitamin K in addition. And I had a man who came to me because his doctor wanted to do shoulder surgery on him, and he has horrible pain in his shoulder, and he's right-handed, and he can't use his right arm. Eight weeks later, he's completely pain-free, his shoulder's better. My wife, Holly, has spent the last five years fighting a degenerating knee. She has been going to the gym and getting very careful physical therapy. She's had her, the knee operated on and cartilage whacked out. And the orthopod looks at her and says, well, I suppose you need a total knee. I started her on 20,000 units of vitamin D and K2 three months ago. And yesterday, she ran down a hill with me. But she hasn't run down that hill for five years. And she says her pain's completely gone. In anti-aging medicine, we want to maintain vision, memory, and mobility. 
Let's face it, if you're 100 years of age, you know who you are, what you are, where you are, you can see, you can get around, you're not old. If you can't do those things when you're 60, you are. So what maintains vision, memory, and mobility is what we look at. For bone structure, mobility, vitamin K is very, very important. Low intake of vitamin K has been associated with bone loss. This trial is also showing that it's been very effective in preventing and treating osteoporosis. Vitamin K occurs in two natural forms. Vitamin K1, which is derived from dietary sources, and vitamin K2, which is produced by bacteria in the intestine. The body does need more vitamin K2 than it produces in the intestinal tract. Some of the K1 will become K2. Humans can develop a deficiency of vitamin K in as little as seven days. So it's very amazing. If you're not intaking any vitamin K, your gut's not making any, you can become deficient very quickly. Vitamin K is involved in five main processes in the body. Blood coagulation, bone mineralization, vascular health and elasticity, cell signaling, cancer prevention, and brain cell protection. We're meant to be putting calcium into bones. Anybody here worried about having uh, their bones break when you get older? Osteoporosis an issue in America? So what's going on in America It's making us break our bones? So here's this vitamin central to osteoporosis and anybody here worried about heart disease? <laughs> right. And deficiency of the vitamin that's critical to both those diseases is common. In fact, it's almost universal. But that's not the whole story. Because the whole story was somebody knew this 75 years ago. Four years before the Nobel Prize for vitamin K was given, a researcher who didn't know he was investigating K2 called it Activator X. And he was just a little old dentist in private practice called Weston Price. He went around the world and observed, and he just paid attention. He's born in Canada, practiced in Cleveland for about 50 years, got to be bored with his practice. He got tired of drilling teeth in kids. And he says, there's parts of the world where people don't have cavities. And he was curious, so he went to any place he could find where people didn't have Western food. And what he observed was they all had square faces and healthy arches in their mouths and full faith. They never had to have wisdom teeth pulled. They never got cavities. They never got tuberculosis. They didn't get cancer. They didn't have heart disease. But first of all, they had healthy teeth until they got exposed to Western food. The first thing that would come would be tooth decay and then dental arch defects and then gum disease and then heart disease and then diabetes. And so he asked the question, why are these people so healthy? He found some common threads. Food that can be transported long distance, stored without spoiling, rice, white flour, sugar, vegetable fat, canned goods, is trouble. Causing lousy teeth, crowded dental arches, cavities, da 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 da, and eventually tuberculosis. And his findings were traditional diets contained four times the mineral and water soluble vitamins that we eat in America, and ten times the fat soluble vitamins. At that time he didn't know K, but he knew A, D, and E. So he comes back to America and he makes what he calls Activator X. So he got the butterfat of cows eating rapidly growing green grass. And he mixed that with cod liver oil. And cod liver oil has high vitamin A and vitamin D in it. And guess what he did? He cured cavities. Anybody here never had a cavity? Can you imagine curing a cavity with a supplement? Curing. I'm going to show you pictures. He published x-rays. It wasn't until 2007, though, that we made the connection what what he had found was vitamin K2. 20 cavities, cured. So what went wrong? How did we become deficient? What did Austin Price observe? They were eating grass-raised animal products. What happened to America? Anybody have any grass-raised animal products here? This is what you're eating. See the grass in this picture? See the grass in this picture? It's no grass, no sunlight, no dirt, just artificial feed. We thought it was omega-3 fatty acids. But in fact, it wasn't just the omega-3 fatty acids. It was a K2. 
You are what you eat, but you are also what your animals eat. So what foods have K2 in them? Well, they're foods that are yellow, because yellow means they're getting omega-3 fatty acids. In America, we feed our cows cottonseed oil so that our butter doesn't melt at room temperature, so you can leave it on the dining room table. The French don't like that flavor. They're picky about their butter. They want grass-raised butter. So guess how many heart attacks the French have? Half of American. Every food they eat, ingredient number one is butter. And they have half the heart disease we do. And suddenly it's like, bingo, they're eating grass-raised butter. They've got half the heart disease we do. This is not a trivial issue. So they can get away with eating butter and have no heart disease. So research finding. For egg, for example, eggs, two different kinds of eggs, grass-raised chicken eggs have 25% less saturated fat, two-thirds more A, double the omega fats, three times the vitamin E, 50% more folate, 70% more B12, much more vitamin D, 30% less cholesterol, more K2. Uh, the yolk of the egg is the most similar to human protein of all known sources. The yolk is pure HDL cholesterol, no bad fat. It's how you cook them that makes a difference. If you take that yolk and you scramble it, it becomes completely toxic, bad, rancid. It's called uh, lipid peroxide fat. Never scramble eggs. Don't ever eat them. If you're going to have an omelet, take out the yolk. If you're going to have French toast, take out the yolk. If you're going to make a meatloaf, take out the yolk. If you're going to bake, take out the yolk and use King Arthur flour so you don't get bromine. So you never want to eat a scrambled egg. You never want to eat anything that has a yolk in it that's been ruptured and heated. As long as that yolk is intact, over easy, over hard, with the membrane protecting it, it's 100% good for you. And you should eat more. Watch your sodium. This is wrong also for 90% of the world. You can't digest protein and you can't get glucose or amino acids into a single cell in your body without sodium. Salt is an essential element that makes the heart pump and so is potassium. In order for a heart muscle contraction to take place and inject that blood, it needs the sodium potassium pump to be working perfect. Sodium is not bad. Sodium is necessary. Sodium is a preservative. You don't want garbage sodium that has chemicals on it that has been stripped of all the good nutrients. When you look at salt, salt is not white like the salt on the table in the restaurant. Salt needs to be a pink color and needs to have veins of minerals running through it. That is real salt. You need high quality salt. If you want to learn more, go on Amazon and buy a book called Water and Salt, written by a female physician. It is loaded with eye-opening, life-saving research. You want to know that your body has the right levels of sodium potassium to make the heart function properly, to make the blood vessels be able to squeeze the blood through, to pump it from your calf up to your brain when you stand up out of a chair. If you stand up out of a chair and you're feeling faint for a little bit, for a few minutes, and you have to sit down and get yourself, you've got to make sure that your blood vessels and your heart have the right nutrients to be able to pump the blood through. Women who take extra calcium for osteoporosis are at greater risk of heart attack. They get three fewer broken bones, but six more heart attacks. And you're getting eight to ten times more calcium in your diet than women in India. Women in India have denser bones than you do. But don't take calcium. You get plenty of calcium in your diet. The calcium doesn't know what to do with itself. What you need is something to do it. You just got to have the K2 to do it. Okay, the conundrum, too much calcium in arteries, too little in bones. Mm -hmm. Why? Both processes are caused by inadequate K2. Women from Tokyo and Northeast in Japan eat natto. Women from Osaka and down don't. In fact, they think those Northern Japanese are crazy. They say that stuff tastes horrible. Guess who has more hip fractures? Right. There's a strong association between osteoporosis and Alzheimer's and a strong association in blood levels for folks with Alzheimer's. We know that K2 helps your brain myelinate itself and keep them wrapped properly. If you do a microscopic picture of somebody's face and count the wrinkles and measure their vitamin K2 level, linear relationship. Skin wrinkles. The severity of wrinkles correlates directly with osteoporosis risk. 
I couldn't get my wife to take K2. I told her about reducing osteoporosis. She didn't pay attention. I told her about heart disease, 57%. She didn't put down the magazine. I told her about skin wrinkles. She says, bring me home two bottles. <laughs>